Okay, we have sound, we have music, we have action. Okay. This is going to be a, um, a brief introduction to all things machine learning in about 20 minutes or so. And then I'm going to... Then I'm going to step into uh, doing a, a bit of live demos using Colab notebooks and even a bit of machine learning, um, some sneak preview of some of the newer machine learning features we are building out and putting into the code editor itself. So uh, you have less of an involved process of working with um, your TensorFlow models within the code editor itself. Are we okay? Uh, yes, sorry. So just for people who can't hear access the presentation, if they just reload their Gmail page and try yeah. the links again, again yes. Yes, I, I see a lot of uh, requests for access in my Gmail inbox right now. I'm going to ignore them all <laughs> because you should have access on the agenda page now. Um, any other admin before we get going? I think lunch after this and uh, office hours in the afternoon um, is the way it's going to go after this. Um, yeah, TensorFlow, let's, let's jump into machine learning. If I click hard enough, I can step through. Okay, this is a, this is a cartoon of what machine learning looks like at Google. Um, we have machines, uh, they learn. Uh, the, 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 the data centers, uh, that, that's a picture of a real Google data center, and really they are that colorful, actually, because it is useful to color code things when you're dealing with that much hardware. Um, I was trying to do the calculation. Um, what is Earth Engine in tons of hardware? And I think if you, went, you used all, got all the computers, all the hard drives that Earth Engine is physically, it would probably fit in this room. Um, but you'd be, you know, six foot racks full of hardware throughout the room and uh, several tons of just, you know, storage capacity. Um, yeah, measuring computers in tons is a bit unusual, but that, that's roughly the volume of um, support infrastructure that's uh, dedicated towards running the Earth Engine queries and, and batch exports and so on continuously. Sorry. What type of hard drive do you use? Oh, it is still all commodity hard drives. I don't know if they're in the 10 terabyte range now or, or what, but whatever storage is at the best price point when they buy the next you know, batch. Um, Google data sets and machines, ooh, I have lost track of the typical number of cores and number of drives they work with. We typically have machines which are compute intensive and we balance that off against machines which have 30 disk drives attached or something like that for the more storage intensive operations. Um, it's a very large shared architecture. Um, I don't have up-to-date numbers, and actually I'm afraid if I did, I might not be able to tell you. <laughs> um, I, I am surprised myself when I get down into an Earth Engine job running on an individual data center machine, just how, how beefy those machines <laughs> are these days. They are also um, completely shared infrastructure. Um, Earth Engine works, we have some dedicated machine clusters. We also have what's called batch quota allocated to us, which is on request, when you do a large export job, we will request machines from the rest of the Google infrastructure. And, you know, if we're lucky, uh, our, our quota, our, our precedence is not the highest uh, among Google jobs. Um, if, if, you know, YouTube has a lot of work to do, do in that data center, YouTube will take precedence over us and we will see YouTube kicked you off <laughs> in our logs. Uh, oh, well, the job will restart. Um, <laughs> But uh, that, that's how we can actually provide a lot of uh, Google compute power for very little costs to the Earth Engine team. It's because we're on this, this shared infrastructure and, you know, fitting into the cracks of available machine resources sometimes. Um, but it, it makes sure that Google machines are very well utilized, you know, on average across that whole fleet. Um, the picture on the right-hand side of the screen is actually one of the TensorFlow compute modules that, that plugs into the um, data center hardware. There are two large CPUs on that and a, a lot of RAM and other networking hardware too by the looks of it. There's also very large heat sinks bolted onto that because 
the biggest problem when you're running compute at this scale is keeping things cool. Um, you measure compute in, in tons, as I'm saying, and roughly for every ton of compute hardware, we have a ton of air conditioning hardware to keep it cool as well. And, uh, that's the way you build data centers. Um, there was a fun story at IBM lab near where I work, where they built the, the data center in the middle of the building, built the offices around the edge, and they just used the heat from the data center to keep everybody else warm. And then they replaced the computers with more efficient machines and everybody got cold. So <laughs> bad planning for, for computer evolution there. Um, the car cartoon in the middle of the screen is um, a very rough sketch about how a, a neural network works. Um, I'll, I'll get some prettier sketches as we move on. But first, um, machine learning more broadly. Um, machine learning is all about prediction and there are you know, hundreds of ways of predicting your y variables from your x variables. Uh, here are four little sketches. Uh, logistic regression is perhaps the, the easiest sketch and the most you know, direct representation of uh, what machine learning is doing. You've got you know, x1, x2, you can just mark out there, as your two x variables. That, that sets up uh, you know, the range of values. And then you've got a, a point cloud sitting above the x1, x2 axis. And you're hoping that your y values fit on a nice curve in that cluster. Uh, you, you assume they fit on a nice curve in that cluster. And the job is looking at all the red training points, build the gray curve so that whenever you, I present you with an x1, x2 pair, you can predict what y value it should be given that curve. And almost all uh, machine learning work fits into this prediction kind of paradigm. Um, you may have very many y variables. Your y variables might be all the points in your image or something, sorry, very many x variables. And your x variables may be all the points in your image and the y variable will be a a class value which you're trying to predict, or uh, some elaborate vegetation index even. Um, there are other ways to structure this machine learning problem. Um, one typical way is Bayesian classification, and I'm not going to walk through the whole formula here, and here the A's are the X's or the inputs, and you want to know the probability of a particular output state, a particular class label, for example, from some range of inputs. And you don't know that probability, but you can use Bayes' rule if you know the bunch, you know, if I was uh, grassland, I would expect to see um, these colors and these bands on the landscape. And those expectations may be known, you know, the measured values for grasslands are easy enough to determine and you know, the probability of getting that color given, given that it's grassland is a, uh, something you can measure from, from ground truth. Bayes lets you plug in these probabilities, um, multiply by other um, priors and evidences, and get a predicted class label by basically inverting the B given A from A given B. Um, that was a very quick summary of what Bayes' law is. That would be a, se that would be a separate conference to <laughs> go into that in enough detail. And I don't have the slides ready for that. Um, one of the other classifiers we have on Earth Engine is the random forest idea, where your X's plug into separate decision tree models. A decision tree is basically a bunch of um, automatically determined if-then rules. If uh, the red band is greater than this value, then start checking the green band, and the green band is less than that, then you're down that corner of the tree and your class label is, yes, it's grassland. Um, you do that and you regenerate those decision trees multiple times because they're never perfectly accurate and you're never um, sure what the top level and the subsequent levels of the tree should be. Um, it turns out that this kind of voting model ends up with a more accurate prediction in consensus. You take the class labels and you aggregate or vote on them and get a Y value like that. Um, this is exactly the, the random forest classifier that uh, we've been demoing before. Um, again, it fits into the paradigm of, you know, predict my Y from the X's. Um, there are other ways to do machine learning too, and a classic example is, is nearest neighbors. Okay, ignore all the shading, just look at the dots. We've got a bunch of red dots and blue dots. We've labeled landscape points as red and blue. Now I come along and I present 
and I, I look at you know click on that point in the map somewhere like that and the way you classify is is almost naively easy you look it's called k nearest neighbors you look at the k points closest to you say the 10 points closest to the point of interest and you just do a voting model on that you say am i mostly surrounded by blue okay i must be blue and you know shading is now now done kind of according to that model so if i'm somewhere at the boundary of a red and a blue point it's going to say well this point is actually mostly surrounded by blue or it's closest to blue this point they've decided is actually mostly surrounded by red that's kind of dubious looking at that picture right there um, but you use that uh, direct vote and this is an example of a machine learning model that you don't really need to train very much you can just use your raw data and build out um, you can predict based from comparing things to your raw data um, that's prediction um, neural networks then is just another way to do prediction you've taken whatever pile of mathematics um, which you've gone through to compute y from x's and say I'm going to allow almost any kind of arithmetic operations with any kind of weighting to generate a y from an x so the way you read this um, complicated diagram is I'm going to take x1 value, I'm going to multiply it by a weight, which is weight sub 4, 1. I'm going to weight, multiply it by many different weights and feed it into this, this layer here. And this layer will get you know a weighted sum of the x1, x2. <coughs> it will do some aggregation function on that it'll boost high values or suppress low values usually it's some uh, transfer curve you get an output layer from the hidden layer that that is now saying okay it's almost a simple classifier all by itself you're saying you know suppose these input values here were a red green blue channel um, I decide that I'm going to weight red as 2 and green as 1 and uh, blue is zero. In other words, I'm sensitive mostly to red pixels. If those are the three weights, then this one will be an out given output which is largest when it sees a pixel which is mostly red. It, it, it's a, by itself, it's a small primitive operation. And yeah, th this one may be sensitive to red, this one may be sensitive to a, a high ratio of red to blue or something like that. Um, those weights then you know you, you do all the arithmetic you populate through to another layer and there may be multiple layers you end up with a number coming out the far end which you know you hope if you're lucky um, actually represents the class of interest how does it actually end up representing the class of interest uh, these machine these neural networks need to be trained um, and training is the uh, the magic set of operations which make the whole field of neural networks possible really. You start by giving giving ground truth data. You give the, the bunch of X's, a bunch of scenes or pixels that you you want to classify from. You give Y the ground truth which you want, you expect the outputs to be. You present X's and Y's as a pair and you, you start off with this random race in your network and you see, oh, uh, <coughs> it meant to give me a Y value of three when I put my random weights through and trained it it gave me a y value of two it's close but not close enough uh, i need to okay it was th there's a what we call a loss function <coughs> um three minus two in the, in this case um you are one step away and you need to go down a bit sorry up three was my goal you need to go up a bit from two so you just uh hill climb basically incrementally move towards that approach you add a bit to all the weights in this layer and uh, move it a bit closer towards the three value it should have been. Um, you don't move it all the way towards three because uh, you don't want to overcorrect. Because the next thing you're going to do is present a different XY pair coming in, and that's going to, you know, using the same weights, go through the network and give you a, you know, a value of four for that uh, particular X input, let's say. Um, and you need to move that value four down towards three. and this is a very brief introduction to the kind of gradient descent methods we have. Um, you gradually uh, 
iteratively converge on getting the right weights throughout the networks. Once you have the right weights at this level, you then backpropagate, it's called, to uh, basically apply the same process all over again, the next layer back in the network, and push, correct, gradually correct the values of the weights all the way back through the beginning of the network. Um, the reason why uh, machine learning is so computationally expensive is basically because uh, you're doing a lot of these weight calculation passes and a lot of these backpropagation passes. In, in the networks I'm going to demonstrate, there's thousands <coughs> to tens of thousands of weights you want to propagate and thousands of tens of thousands of training points that you want to train on. Um, it gets computationally expensive very fast and yeah, the computations put out a lot of heat <laughs> in the end. Um, yes, there's a link here um, which explains all this in, in a whole lot more detail. Um, you end up working with this at the, at the concept, at the level of layers and, and not of individual weights, not of training at all. Uh, PensorFlow and other machine learning platforms just do all that for you. you. You trust that it works, you trust that it's going to converge reasonably quickly, um, and you trust that. Yeah, the mathematics has been worked out correctly in advance. Um, so to play that through for a, a slightly more realistic example, um, this is actually a classic training machine learning data set. We've got a you know, botanical library of various measurements of, of, of flower properties. Um, sorry about that? Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, Two hidden layers in this one are, you know, for a given flower, uh, I will have values for all of these. It'll get multiplied by weights and added and multiplied again and added again, multiplied again and get a value which, if you're lucky, corresponds to the correct species over there. And you present these probabilities and propagate it back to set the weights when you want to train with it. If you actually were to implement exactly that model in um, TensorFlow, there are a bunch of TensorFlow uh, functions and Python operations which let you fetch data from your, your database of, of known features and labels. Um, you provide it with a set of feature columns, declare them numeric in this case, and in this case we're running a neural network classifier on a uh, two hidden layer network. So in this image, whoops, not that image, this image, um, uh, I've set up two hidden layers of 10 each and you specify that here and output is gonna have three classes which are set up in the labels there. Lastly, in TensorFlow, you give it an output path where it's actually gonna store the, the trained model. Interesting. Um, as you get um, through multiple layers in the network and you start building these networks, the networks may have you know, 16 layers if you're building a rich network, or hundreds of layers if you're building a, a really deep uh, perceptual network. Um, each layer learns a concept at some level of abstraction. Um, you can think of it a lot like the human perceptual system. If you look at you know, pull apart a brain and look at how the, la the neurons are responding to you know, visual sight, uh, the neurons closest to the retina and the first system in the, the back of the brain will pick up just simple vertical horizontal lines and patches of color. And uh, then as you build up through the brain layers, um, they learn, you know, shapes and then recognizable objects and then, you know, human form and then individual people kind of thing as you go through the layers. Um, these abstractions build up, you know, build up more abstract representations in terms of less abstract ones. Uh, okay, I, I'll go into more pictures of, of networks, but I want to talk about um, the kind of things we can use for in a remote sensing. And it's basically all the use cases we've been talking about so far, um, the, the primary difference between um, the kind of classifiers we've worked in so far is uh, the notion of a receptive field. Um, we've been working pretty much a pixel at a time so far. You look at that pixel, look at the bands, look at maybe the time series behind that pixel, and use that to compute a 
class for that pixel. Um, in a way, you can think of it as detecting you know, the material at that pixel. But if you want to learn, for example, that there's a road in this image, you know, material at pixel is not going to tell you that. And even if it did tell you asphalt, um, how do you know it's a road? The road is a shape. You need to look at, you know, a patch of pixels at one time. And that patch of pixels is called a receptive field. It's the, the input to the neural network. And you know, how, how the material is arranged in space. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to tell road from just a single pixel value. Um, you want to look at, you know, vertical horizontal lines and, and shapes that, that build up from the pixel. Um, what kind of uh, features can you use? And again, it, it's a all of the above kind of answer. You can throw almost anything you like as the input layer at the network, whether it is raw spectral values or, you know, the full Landsat time series. Um, it also helps a lot to give the network um, summary statistics which you feel are relevant. If you are working with vegetation, give it a directly computed NDVI as one of the inputs per pixel or um, other, you know, variants and other summary statistics as well. Um, the nice thing about networks is that they will train to use the features which they find are important. You know, if you give it more than it needs and some of it is irrelevant for the task at hand, it will adjust the weights accordingly so that uh, they don't attach much weight or score to to those features and you know you gave it NDVI it, it'll attach a larger weight to NDVI hopefully and use that as you know input to the next layers. Um, here's just a bunch of links to, to, to really get going on TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow is oh I'm going to call it the earth engine of machine learning how about that? <laughs> it, it, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, it's um, again a, a set of client libraries very much like Earth Engine again a set of you know, computes and compute clusters very much like Earth Engine um, specialized for the task of machine learning um, it's designed to be free and open source again very much like Earth Engine to, to enable as many researchers as possible to build deep uh, machine learning models and you know, people have built up on top of that. The, the, the Keras, for example, library I'll be demonstrating is um, integrated with TensorFlow now. And the, the community is able, again, very much like Earth Engine, to take the basic TensorFlow primitives and build and collaborate on that. Um, yeah, it, you can describe it in terms of a, a number of uh, layers of the stack. If possible, we like to work at, at the highest layers possible. We work with carers who work with individual, you know, train and predict operations. And if you can work with just the train and predict interfaces, so much the better. Uh, underneath it, you will see the way you configure individual layers, for example. And uh, we'll look at the Python API, but TensorFlow has APIs available in many languages. We, you know, keep the, the kernel and the execution engine is available as a package, but usually you can run on Google uh, Cloud resources to run that. Okay, let's get into uh, the magic of convolutional neural networks. Uh, this is uh, a slide which must have taken someone a long time to put together. But um, we're looking at that one input pixel there, and in between the input and the output, there's this. Okay, stop. It's going to restart again. There's a, in this case, a three by three grid. And uh, you look at the pixel and you look at the three by three neighborhood, all nine, all eight pixels around that pixel. And you do this uh, pairwise sum of one by one, that total of all nine values adds up to nine in this case and goes into that cell. Um, you've summarized that neighborhood of pixels with some value in the output cell. Um, in this case, this grid of nine is a nice, pretty Laplacian kind of kernel. Um, in general, these nine weights would be what the machine learning train al training algorithm actually adjusts to yeah, reach the uh, objective function which you, you have defined for it. Um, so we use this basic idea of 
uh, yeah. In this case, the kernel is doing that kernel does a sharpening operation. It'll like, emphasize the edges in your landscape or whatever the source image is. The way this convolution is then used, uh, this is a sketch. You sh this is the input image. Each block here is meant to represent a layer or possibly a combination of layers. <coughs> and, you know, slightly higher level, you maybe have tens of thousands of weights in this picture. You will do a convolution of all the pixels around the, the edge of that car there and in, into a, a single you know, number in the, this block of values here. You will then take this, this cube of values and do the same <coughs> kind of operation. Um, the operation at the next step, and this happens quite often, you'll see this kind of sequence of conv convolve and then pool. <coughs> the, the nice thing about convolution is it generates as many uh, outputs as you have inputs in the image. The, the, the not so nice thing about convolution is it generates too many outputs. Um, you will often want to just condense you know, a grid of nine values or a grid of you know, 25 values into a single value at the next level. And that operation is called pooling. And you know, the simplest pooling <coughs> operation is just max pooling. You take the maximum of all the values. It sounds like you're, you're losing a lot in that process, but max pooling actually works pretty well. Um, so the whole point of that is to, again, summarize, um, end up with fewer values in the next step. Um, talking about fewer values. Um, yes, we, we, I, I said we're, we've got infinite compute power. We, we're dealing with a huge amount of resources. Um, you could train with a very large network, but there's such a thing as having a network which is too large. Um, if your network is too large, it's like having, uh, you know, what, what, okay. It, it's able to learn every point in the input data set separately. I, I've given you, you know, 10 million images and I've told you that these ones are cars and these ones are fish. It just learns every image one by one and says, okay, if you present this one to me again, I'll say it's a car. It doesn't, you know, if it has the number of weights, and size, basically the memory capacity, to uh, remember every input image separately, it won't do a good job of generalizing. Uh, it won't need to, uh, and the training algorithm won't converge on, you know, abstractions like, you know, I need to look for wheels to correctly identify things as a car. It'll just, you know, photographic memory style, you know remember that image pixel by pixel and it, it can because it has enough weights it can use to uh, you know encode all that information so while we have very deep very large networks there, there's a trade-off to be made um, to, to keep the networks you know parsimonious and not uh, overfit and directly memorize the data too much you will see this happening um, when you run a network you will do like we've done with these other classifiers you will have Test, training and test data and it'll do awesomely on the training data and then you give it the test data and uh, it's like it's never seen it before it can't generalize at all um, and that that's typically the symptom of overfitting it's learned the training data very very well but it it's hasn't picked up any of the abstractions as it learned it uh, and you solve that problem by typically reducing the size of your network here's a a more graphical picture of what's going on, um, kind of that, that, that mental layers model. Uh, the first layer may be responsive to images that look like that. In other words, if I give you, a let's say, a horizontal line, some uh, node in the first layer will give a high output value for horizontal lines. Uh, if I give you you know, color patches of these various sorts, other, other nodes will respond to that. And when, when these nodes have responded to, oh, look, I see lots of horizontal lines, the next layer will say, oh, it's, I don't see a horizontal line texture here, but it's, it's a texture consisting of horizontal lines with a little bit of, you know, curvature on them too. Um, the next layer will pick up textural information. The next layer perhaps will pick up more, you know, high-level shape. We've got these spherical blobby objects. Um, and as you work through the network, layers will start responding to combinations of horizontal lines and blobby objects and, oh, look, it's a car. Um, 
and uh, at the end you often try to set up the network in fact this is a better example here um, you build a final layer which does you know a maximum function you've got signals which fire for car and truck and van etc and you say well no really I want you to pick the maximum of those and give me a single class layer this becomes a compute, complete uh, network architecture um, Okay, this is the same kind of architecture picture again. You, you convolve it down, uh, and this is a pattern which repeats a lot. You force, in a way, the input image to be summarized in just a few numbers in the sixth layer as you go through. Once you have a summary of you know, a parsimonious representation of what the input image is, you then uh, you know, bring some of these layers forward and use that summary to drive an image which is the same size as the input image again, but every pixel on the input image has been labeled into car, house, tree, in this case. Uh, so this kind of you know, reproject onto the input is, is a very common network architecture as well. Okay, um, let's, let's get into Earth Engine for a bit. Uh, the basic data flow is going to look like this. Um, it's going to be a combination workflow of Earth Engine on the one side and a Python notebook on the other side. The flow will be we will create a table of test and training data. Um, we will create and then run on the Python notebook side. We will do the machine learning classification and drive the TensorFlow libraries from there. Um, then um, you know, training the model is, is half the work. Uh, we then want to actually use the model to predict, you know, from some other landscape image, um, export some data in image format for TensorFlow to work with, run again in the Python notebook a prediction operation. That produces TensorFlow records again, which we can upload into Earth Engine and <coughs> continue our analysis there if we need to, or build uh, exported layers or, or something like that. I'm going to, okay, so this is a link that you can follow and I can drop into it here. Um, the first, yes, Sorry, yes. Um, just a note on what you've yeah. got to use to try and check the link. Yes, does that one work? Because it's in a GitHub repository, you can't access it without tiny keys. Um, so there's still mm -hmm. a lot of people can access it using tiny keys, but the other people won't be able to at this point, unless um, you can maybe make a copy on your Google Drive and share that link. Okay. Yeah. So if, if I log out my, my profile, my one of the accounts, and then it works. And I put in the, the link to the talk, then I've got to edit out a problem. Okay. And basically what I did is I had to download it then and put in my client and it Okay, you downloaded it from the GitHub uh, and put it there. So, so I said yeah. that, but I, I'm, not, I'm not signed in at all. Okay. In any way, and then it's fine. Okay, so, so you, you can't even get into Colab? Uh, you can use Colab, but for some reason, um, I couldn't find it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Can you maybe explain what you did to get in? I don't know. I did the profile. And then you made it. And then I, I, it took about the Jane and talk. No. No. Yeah. Oh, the profile. Yeah. Oh, the profile. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It, it, it gives you an edit or it times out and doesn't connect. Um, but a lot of ways that. Fail to fetch. Fail to fetch. From, from the whole life. Okay. Oh, okay. Technical difficulties. Okay, we. I'll, I'll link this from the uh, the agenda page once we've found a way to get this to work. But uh, uh, okay, so um, th this notebook is is large. Um, it also has some pretty expensive um, operations in it. So I am going to. Okay, let me make sure it works for me still. Oh, go away. Run anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, if this first step succeeds, I'm much happier. Okay, great. Um, 
Um, yeah, let's, let's see how we're going to do this. Okay, so this is going to be a bit, bit tedious to walk through all of it, so I'm going to focus on, on the, the exciting bits. Uh, most of the first steps here are uh, very much you know, the same as... Yeah, it, it's all the same setup kind of flow that Madhu was talking about before. Um, you have to get a token and paste it back in here. Um, the interesting parts start happening with the, uh, okay, as you can see, and that most of the uh, work in this notebook is fetching and preparing imagery. How is that font size? We'll do some pretty standard Earth Engine operations to filter out a bunch of Landsat images and prepare that image. Um, let me see if I have everything set up here. I haven't initialized yet. Okay, so I am going to be, okay. Rather than step through all the boring parts, I'm going to walk through this notebook directly and um, you can work through this a line at a time later. The final step on the Earth Engine side is running these two exports first, or exporting a, a table of the training data we've prepared to cloud storage and a very similar ta ta table of testing data. That runs in, um, yeah, as an Earth Engine export task, it'll take five to 10 minutes to do this export and you can watch this task running. Okay, this notebook has all sorts of extra steps to, to check that the files are there once you've exported and so on. Um, there's another demo of exporting things in TF record format, which we're going to use later as well. Okay, now, now the TensorFlow stuff actually starts. Um, set up uh, column definitions using the TensorFlow types. We've now completely left the Earth Engine world. Set up um, parsing records to uh, read the exported records in, in, again into TensorFlow types. The other thing we're doing in the TensorFlow world is actually uh, adding extra features directly. So. Again, yeah, we, we've decided that NDVI is, is going to be a useful supplemental input to the classifier, so we add that to every pixel as we're importing it into TensorFlow. Okay, um, once the data is prepared, the, uh, the meat of the algorithm fits on the screen <laughs> quite nicely, uh, mainly due to the very handy uh, Keras uh, model specification library. We've, we've done the parsing routines, okay, we've, we've prepared the input data set, we've got the classes, um, a bit more set up to uh, convert the inputs to tuples. <coughs> so now we finally have the input data set. The key routine is just the model here. We say we want a sequential array of layers. We're going to do a, a dense 64 node layer as input. Um, we're going to do a, a dropout layer. I, I didn't talk about dropout, but I did talk about overfitting. Um, you know, one way to convince a network not to have a perfect memory, not, not to remember each input scene literally, is to uh, deliberately give it amnesia. You, you randomly delete some of the weights or some of the nodes from the network and a different random set every time. And uh, this sounds like, uh, like brain surgery, and I suppose it is. Um, it, it's, it's one of the techniques that have been developed by the machine learning community over the years, and it just it just works. It is the, the only you know, heuristic justification for doing it. Uh, you apply a dropout layer and your network won't overfit too much. Sorry. Yes, is it not working at all? Yeah. I've copied the link to my drive yeah. and I've pasted a link that you guys should all be able to access on the agenda. So if you refresh the okay. lesson link, like I'm the UDK presentation, yeah. and if you guys copy that into your browser, it should be able to open up. And then you click, it'll open up a thing that says something about work preview available. 
But at the bottom, there's a thing that says congregatory. So you yeah. click on it, and then it will open up the notebook. So anyone okay. that wants to follow us. Okay. So, um, yeah, sorry about all this. I, I, I borrowed this from another summit presentation where they had it working before, so I assumed it would work again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It works if you're not on these computers. Yeah. 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 Ye
green, and let me tell you directly, yeah, red is, is wetland around lakes, green is forests, and blue is, is grassland regions. Uh, if I turn the layer off, you can see the, the underlying, well, let's turn satellite imagery on. Um, so the underlying image is really suburbia and uh, you know, swimming pools and small lakes and so on. Um, I turn this layer back on. Okay, wait for it to load. Okay. Um, do we have it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, there's just three colors there. Uh, what we've done in this case is taken all the uh, work of moving data around and put it in a short code edit description instead. The, the two co crucial functions are here, um, a preparing Landsat image, and yeah, this kind of pattern we've seen a few times now. We have a bunch of optical bands, we've picked pick thermal bands, we've um, computed a spectrum band, computed, we've added the year to it, we've added the year as a uh, cosine and a sine measure, you know, with experience from doing that uh, linear harmonic fit, if you provide the cosine and the sine of time, um, the neural network will be able to learn um, a similar kind of harmonic coefficient itself without you having to do a, a linear regression explicitly. We pile all these bands together. We've even got a latitude band. Uh, pile all those in to each pixel and give that as input to the network. And now this network, I know, has been trained with exactly the same set of bands, so it's going to you know, be compatible and work on this input. Um, this is a network that has been trained uh, by uh, my colleague Chris already. It is a 16-layer network. I, I showed you the way you can convolve and reconvolve and, and uh, pool and, and then project back up again. 16-layer uh, network, which he calls Blindspot. And it's been run on the Google Cloud AI platform and stored there. Um, once that network has been set up, um, you can write an Earth Engine call. Uh, this has not been released yet, but when it is released, you'll be able to write an Earth Engine call, um, which just gives you parameters to use that, that pre-trained network directly and visualize the results in the app. Um, names and IDs, you've got to do a few small tweaks to the input data types, and you do need to specify 30, pixel, 30 meter pixels. Um, I talked about receptive fields. Um, how big is the input patch that you're using to focus the network in or convolve in on, on the, the input layers? Um, 64 by 64 is, is a smallest patch. Um, the trade-off here is the bigger the patch, the more context you have and the, the more expensive the computation is. Um, and the output here is just a single classification layer. This is actually uh, 10 separate networks because we've got 10 different class labels and we're running them all in parallel. The rest of the script is then pretty straightforward. We uh, run a prediction, yeah, map, map that prediction function, take the stack of images, do two things, prepare the, the exact bands we want, also mask out the clouds as well. I didn't show you the cloud mask function and then run that prediction operation on separately on every image in the stack. And then the last thing we do, having run it separately on every image in that stack, we're doing, we, yeah, doing it in this order, take that prediction and do a mean, and again, average prediction of all images over this time period, and then map colors to something reasonably intuitive except red, wetland is red and show red, green and blue. The one thing you notice on this map is that the predictor was never confused. Uh, these, these pixels are either black or uh, all red, all green or all blue. There are no magenta or yellow or other colors here. In other words, it's learnt all those categories you know, without overlap. Um, So um, 
I am going to wrap up there. This is a unreleased feature. I, I got this from Chris last week just to show you where, where we're heading. Um, no, should be out there in the coming months, uh, depending on how Chris's workload goes. Um, but it will definitely make um, machine learning much more accessible in, in the Earth Engine world. Any questions besides Glenn? But especially Glenn. <laughs> So, so what I, from what I understand, yeah. this, uh, this yeah. new feature that you're showing is that yeah. you, compared to the script that you, the collab yeah. book you showed us before, which is how you would currently implement this, um, is that here the trained model, you don't yeah. have to export the trained model as a TensorFlow, or the, the, the trained yeah. predictions as a TensorFlow yeah. record, <coughs> yeah. re-import them, yeah. but rather you can. <coughs> Call the train model and make predictions yes. in Earth Engine, which is yeah. the heavy lifting, really, because you yeah. could be predicting for a very large area. Very large area, yes. So, yes. So, in a way, it's half the story. The training would still, you know, as we have it here, we have to be done in a, in a collab notebook or something like that. But the the integration and the use of the model um, gets done entirely in the Google Cloud, and you know that that giant cluster of Earth Engine machines sits conceptually close to the giant cluster of TensorFlow machines, um, that cloud communication is now a whole lot quicker. OK, that, that was a very brief demo and sneak preview of TensorFlow, old and new. Some, some of TensorFlow is old already. and. Uh, I hope that was useful. I hope, you, I hope that gave you a good idea of, you know, where, where Earth Engine is going and, and the kind of large-scale um, landscape classifications you're able to do with it now. All right, so we are going to break for lunch and then move forward to uh, office hours and more uh, build-a-thon time in the afternoon. Alta, did you want to say anything?